Well, apologetics and evangelism is my passion. I love to read about it. I love to do it. I love to approach it with uh, right brain creativity. I do some odd things in my evangelism. Sometimes I walk up to people with a piece of artwork, and I'll say, uh, here's two pieces of art I've done. Which do you like the best? I say, well, I like this one. Why do you like it? And then uh, that leads into a conversation about why do you think beauty, aesthetics, are part of our human experience? Suddenly, we're off to the races with a gospel conversation. So I want to give you many creative conversation starters tonight. And I think you'll be surprised how many things can lead to the gospel. Actually, we shouldn't be surprised because this is all God's world. All facts are in for God. And everything He's created that's not broken to pieces is meant for His glory, right? So it shouldn't be difficult to start gospel conversations. Now, I'm not going to... Uh, delude myself that you're all going to go out and be Billy Grahams after this conference. <laughs> There's no substitute for going out and doing it as one of the best teaching experiences you can have. But I want to give you some approaches that you can employ, you can incorporate, but they're going to take practice if you're going to actually utilize them. So what I'm giving you the next five sessions here is not a silver bullet, it's not a magic template that if you just apply this template, people start giving their lives to Christ. It's a way of conversing with people about the gospel. So let's just call these next five sessions the air war, and once you go out, that's the ground war. Uh, but the military motif, although it's quite frequent in Scripture, has its limitations. In an air war, they tenderize the target, they do reconnaissance, they study it, they do everything necessary for the ground war, but actually, our air war and ground war is a rescue attempt. It's a rescue mission. We're rescuing people from the lies of this culture. But even Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, uses a military, military motif when he says that we are destroying, wrecking, tearing apart speculations and arguments. And every fortress raised up against the knowledge of God, we're tearing it down, demolition. And so we've got to learn how to do that. Our, our unsafe friends have built around themselves a whole list of things that they lock themselves inside to keep God out. They don't know that at the heart of the universe, there is conquering love, able to conquer death, guilt, shame, loneliness, fear, uncertainty, perversion, able to conquer anything that separates from God. And of course, that's all coming to us in the amazing person of Christ. So uh, I'm going to follow the outline, not completely tonight. I'll probably refer to it from time to time. But the power of Christian worldview in evangelism. Why is worldview so essential in evangelism today? Part of the reason why is because we are almost having to learn cross-cultural missionary attempts to reach our nation. That's how far they've moved off the base. 150 years ago plus, what was, the, what was the mandate in America? Get Christ to the nations. But that all changed 100 years ago. Then the question became not how can we get Christ to the nations, but is Christianity entirely true? What about the virgin birth? Hmm. And so these, those first skeptics came in real strong about 100 years ago. And then 50 years ago, there was another change. Now suddenly it was we're not sure Christianity is good for America. And now we've reached a place in the present where the question today is, how can we get Christianity out of the public arena and label it hate speech and relegate it to private piety? That's how much we've changed in 175 years. And so sharing the gospel now is so much different than it was back then. As one evangelist said, who shares our view of soteriology, he said, uh, America is like a mission field never experienced before. It's been inoculated with the gospel, but now sees Christianity as the former age of bigotry and prejudice. And see, that's what we're up against, how difficult it is to share the gospel today if you don't do some dismantling of the false worldviews that hold people hostage. So take a look at your outline, Roman numeral one, know the value of using Christian worldview 
in evangelism. Uh, in the next five sessions, I want to give you some ammunition for your evangelism. I want you to be able to go into every witnessing situation with the confidence that only the truths of Scripture match human experience like a key in a lock. Every single false worldview cannot explain the world, cannot explain human existence, cannot explain why we're here. And so I go into every evangelism situation knowing only what God has revealed here can explain who that person is, what he's experiencing, and what his hopes are. Sometimes we refer to this as what is the source of ultimate reality? It is God himself and his relationship to what he has created. I often go on to secular university campuses, public university campuses to share the gospel. And I went into the cafeteria of a rather liberal school near where I used to live in Valencia. And I asked some students, can you folks tell me what is the nature of reality? What is the nature of reality? They say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, is reality either personal, centered on God himself, or is reality impersonal, just time and chance and molecules and things like that? So one student goes, I know what reality is. I go, what is it? CNN. <laughs> this is actually the answer I received from a university student. So whenever I'm sharing the gospel with people who are biblically illiterate, and that's not a put down, it just means they don't read the Bible at all. I usually go for the cosmological ground, and I'm going to try to define all my terms uh, during these sessions because my critics tell me, hey, you don't define your terms, so I'm going to try to do better. Cosmological ground means the ground which describes our universe, where it comes from, what it is. We call it cosmology because it's about our cosmos. And the Latin on cosmos means beautifully ordered, same word as cosmetics. Sometimes my wife comes out of the bathroom and she's beautifully ordered. Not always before she goes in, but <laughs> cosmology is about beautifully ordered universe. So what is the source of meaning? I want to ask my unsaved friend, how do you see meaning and what is its source? How can you find meaning in an accidental universe? Sometimes I ask my unsaved friends, do you believe that everything came from nothing? How can that possibly be a scientific statement? Doesn't make sense. Even the most rudimentary science believes that every effect has an adequate cause, right? Do you really believe that if molecules bump into each other long enough, they make people, mangoes, and giraffes? I mean, the absurdity of this is incredible, and yet this is being taught in most of our public universities and schools. All right, Roman numeral two. Develop a worldview mindset for more effective evangelism. Now, I was asked to speak to the Campus Crusade group at Cal Poly Pomona. It's a large group of students, over 400. And uh, the veteran Campus Crusade staff member pulled me aside before the talk and said, do you realize that my Christian students here on campus, when they try to share the gospel, they're basically talking past people? There's no point of connection. And that's because these students are so steeped in relativism that they don't believe that God has any meaningful relationship to their life. Uh-oh, I better define relativism. <laughs> relativism means this. A person believes there are no absolute truths that are true for everyone and no absolute moral code that's true for everyone. Therefore, everything is relative to me. You can see why that's so appealing to narcissists. I get to be the final authority. I was witnessing to a, a young woman who was with her male friend from a, from a liberal university, and she actually had the gall to say this, I accept all opinions, I do not judge any opinions, and if your God is fair, he'll be like me. I wanted to step back before the lightning hit, because that is the most blasphemous statement I've ever heard, but that's relativism in shoe leather, isn't it? The person becomes the standard for what is true, real, right, wrong, etc., etc. So students have reached a point in our public schools where they no longer think it's useful to answer ultimate questions. Uh-oh, another term I better define. 
An ultimate question is a question about the nature of reality and human experience, such as, who made you and me? Who am I? What is a human being? Is there a moral standard outside myself that I must adhere to? Why am I here? What's the nature of reality? What happens when you die? Is God knowable? These are all ultimate questions. Now, did you know when the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, before they built any industry, they founded Harvard University? For 200 years, Harvard University had a perfect symbiosis between theology and the liberal sciences and the liberal arts. Not liberal sciences, but between the sciences and the liberal arts, they had a perfect symbiosis. Now, why was that? Because it was assumed you could not get a good education unless you knew what a human being was, where we came from, why there's evil death and suffering, what our job is in the world. You couldn't get a good education unless you could answer ultimate questions. You didn't get your money's worth unless you had ultimate questions answered for you through the Department of Theology. Well, that all changed once Harvard went liberal. But our students today are stuck in a situation. They want meaning, but they believe they're in a meaningless, meaningless universe. They want significance, but they believe they're living in a universe without significance. It's, it's breathtaking. So when I go into a witnessing situation, the reason I begin with worldview is because the gospel doesn't make sense unless God is creator, ruler, and judge. If the universe made itself, defines itself, sustains itself, then what in the world is repentance needed for? <laughs> and so I begin with God's relationship to the creation. Can anybody think of a sermon in the New Testament that begins that way? Acts 17 is correct. When the Apostle Paul is dealing with highly intelligent and biblically illiterate people, he begins with theology. He begins with cosmology. The nature of the universe is what? A wonderfully ordered universe created to glorify God, and he maintains it for his honor and for his purposes. So Paul begins with who God is, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's not ministered to by people. He can't be contained. He's not a local deity. You can't obligate him. You're utterly dependent upon him. So in Acts 17, Paul lays out theology. Now, when I was a brand new Christian, I went to Christian Heritage College in San Diego. And uh, I was quite into sharing my faith. I met a young man in a weight room at a local high school, and he says, I want you to meet my family. I'm actually a foster child. And so I went to meet the family, and just a really wonderful, warm family, but completely unsaved. And so I said, hey, your foster kid Nick here, he's a friendly guy. I'm a Bible student at this other college. Can we gather around after dinner? I want to show you something from the Bible. So they finished washing the dishes, and the whole family is gathered around nine people. I said, this is what Paul says about reality. And I just preached Acts 17. Two or three Tuesdays in a row. Eventually, the mother and the family did become a Christian, and the father also. And so starting with worldview, which is what Paul did in Acts 17, is an excellent way of laying the groundwork for the gospel, because that's what the apostle did. But the folks we're ministering to today, they're giving credit to the creation itself for their origin. In other words, they're basically saying, nature made me. I'm made in the image of matter, not God. Nature made me. That's how they're thinking today. Now, if you want Bible verses for that, that's Romans 1.23 and Romans 1.25. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image of what? Crawling, slimy creatures, tadpoles and salamanders and primitive animals. They gave them the credit for their existence, then the Creator. And they worshiped and served the creation rather than the Creator. And so I'm dealing with people who think that way. Now, the dictionary word for that is paganism. Sometimes we think of paganism as someone who's living the lifestyle of Animal House, completely controlled by animal passions. That's not always so. We have many refined pagans who drive nice cars, who have nice homes who believe that they came from nature and not from God. 
So when I'm dealing with someone who is a pagan thinker, I want to challenge that person to go back and look at what Scripture says about origins. Is ultimate reality chance and the impersonal? If that's so, then where does order and personality come from? How can you give an account of it if chance and the material is ultimate? So one of the verses I use, you might say, well, he doesn't believe the Bible. Why show him the Bible? Well, we're going to do so anyway because the Bible goes where human arguments cannot go, deep into the heart, deep into the conscience. So listen to what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. God and matter are not pre-eternal. <laughs> uh, matter was called into existence at a moment in time. We call that creation by fiat. God spoke it into existence. Well, that certainly changes a person's view of reality. If it's made by God out of nothing and sustained by Him every moment. So what's the next step in reaching into this false worldview of our unsaved friends? Look at your outline Letter B, raise and answer ultimate questions in order to expose assumptions. Now, most unbelievers are getting their worldview from the electronic media. Hollywood is incredibly accomplished at weaving tear-jerking plots to make you sympathize with an immoral person. <laughs> And so our young people go into movies and they set their discernment skills aside and they come out of the movie touched by the plot, but they've never really examined the movie. They just assume, well, that's life as it is. People don't pray. They didn't go to church. The highest value is finding a romantic partner in whatever way you wish. I mean, they come to the movie without discernment and leave without discernment for the most part. That's why in my worldview class at Master's University, one of my assignments is do a full-on discernment of a movie and answer all these worldview questions about the movie. It's just a great habit to get into. We should also do that with TV programs as well because more and more our television programs are signaling and messaging our culture's narrative, which is LGBTQ rights must be protected. Anything that does not protect them is hate. That's being signaled in our TV programs in amazing volume, is it not? We must be discerning. So ultimate questions, you raise ultimate questions, you give the unbeliever a chance to answer them, and then you ask permission to answer them biblically. It's a wonderful approach. I sometimes ask, why is there death and suffering? Is it normal? Is that the only way species could have originated by death and suffering? If you Google what percent of species that ever existed are now extinct today, anybody know the answer, you science folks? Over 99%. Isn't it interesting? Natural selection's really good at making things extinct, but it doesn't really make anything new. <laughs> so we ask ultimate questions. And we give them an attempt to answer them, and then we will answer those ultimate questions from Scripture. In our postmodern culture, there is one heresy. I'm sorry, there's one heresy. In a culture of great permissiveness, there's one heresy. And that heresy is landing somewhere and holding to a truth claim to the exclusion of other truth claims. <laughs> That's the one heresy in postmodern culture. I'll share the gospel anywhere. I was on the beach in Malibu, and I wanted to ask this one surfer if I, could go, if I could take my boogie board in where there were surfers, and we got talking, and I started sharing the gospel with him. He says, I just want you to know I'm late-night host Conan O'Brien's attorney. I said, oh, well, you're an attorney. Let's talk about law. <laughs> so I began bringing in the Ten Commandments and why God is a just lawgiver and He cannot compromise Himself and if there's going to be forgiveness, there must be justice accomplished and so on. And after about a 20-minute conversation, He goes, hey, great talking to you, but just want you to know I have no interest in truth. I'm thinking, boy, don't make me, <laughs> don't make me stereotype lawyers, but He says I have no interest in truth. 
He wanted to keep things relative to himself, didn't he? Because that's how he lives. Self is at the center. And another evidence of this, uh, my wife and I, before we had our daughter, we had a number of exchange students living with us, usually only two at a time most. But this one really sweet girl from Japan, Hiroko, she stayed with us for a full year. Uh, one night after dinner, and she's there staying with us because she wants to improve her English. And so I said, Hiroko, have you ever heard the plan of salvation from the Bible? No. We began sharing the plan of salvation with her. About 15 minutes in, her eyes welled up with water, and some tears came down. And I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, this exchange student's going to get saved. And my wife, often more discerning than me, said, why don't we ask her why she's crying? <laughs> <laughs> And, and this was her answer. I'm crying because my mother said, stay away from Christians. They think they know the truth. <laughs> See, even relativism was the way she was prepared for American Christians. Isn't that something? Uh, I used to live, as I mentioned to you, 100 yards away from one of the top art schools in America. It was founded by Disney, California Institute of the Arts. And uh, they have bumper stickers that are basically little pop sayings that summarize philosophy. Here's one of the bumper stickers. Here's a few of the bumper stickers I read while walking around CalArts. God is too big to fit into one religion. That's a worldview, isn't it? That's a worldview. Eve was framed. Okay? It's probably a feminist view. The earth doesn't belong to us. We belong to the earth. That's the Gaia principle. Uh, religion is the only reason the poor don't murder the rich. Well, that may be ending soon. Don't postpone joy. Stop hate radio. Stop the long war against choice. See, much of this is going to involve redefinition. Stop the long war against choice. See, choice is now on the highest imaginable throne and seeks to op seeks to operate from the position of the new moral high ground. Choice legitimizes everything now, including a third trimester baby. So when I ask worldview questions to my unsaved students and friends, they always answer as if they are objective, unbiased truth seekers, just lacking data, and perhaps the reason, that's the reason they don't believe what I believe. But that's not the case. According to Scripture, we know the heart of the unregenerate person. We know what the natural man is like on the inside. Jesus and the apostles tell us in so many places, as well as the Old Testament prophets telling us as well. So let us see in your outline. Understand that believers barricade themselves inside erroneous worldviews to lock out the gospel. The very thing they need, they're seeking to lock out. It's like a bunch of prisoners who check the locks before bed. Oh, good, we're locked in. Oh, good, we can't get out. We like our prison cell. Incarceration is wonderful. The unbeliever does not merely need proofs and evidences piled sky high. He needs the convicting work of the Spirit. He needs the Word of God exposing his thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12, this is exactly what has to go on. And he's pushing that away because he believes that God's intrusion into his life is a radical conflict of interest. Therefore, he will defend himself from any potential judgment. And so one of the values in using these worldview questions is it brings the unbeliever's hostility to God to the surface so that we can hear it from his own lips. Now you say, why would that be good? Why is that valuable? for the unbeliever to have his own antagonism toward God uttered from his own lips. You'd be surprised how much God uses that in convicting them. It's true in my case. I said something blasphemous as an unbeliever and that haunted me for years until I got saved and was forgiven. I was witnessing to a graduating senior at Cal Arts University. He's a drama major. He was sitting there kind of brushing up on his drama, the play he'd written. And as we're talking about the Lord and the laws of God and so on, he said, I want to tell you the difference between you and me. You're willing to wait for absolute happiness until you get to heaven. I demand now 
whatever I want. Drugs, sex, whatever, now. And that's going to haunt him. He basically defied God's rightful ownership of him in that statement. But he heard it from his own lips. And I believe God will use that in convicting him. And please don't see this, folks, as us setting a trap for unbelievers. But we want to have them see their worldview scrutinized. Many unbelievers have never had their worldview scrutinized. Ever. One of the places I often witness was at a cigar store where there's a lot of overstuffed leather chairs that smell like cigars. And uh, I was in that cigar store with a couple Christian student friends of mine, and there's a group of about seven or eight people, and this one gentleman says, well, I just want everybody to know here that I'm an atheist, and I think that's the best way to go. And he takes a big puff on his cigar. And so I say, well, I'm assuming that you believe that worldview will hold together, and you wouldn't be afraid of subjecting it to some scrutiny. He goes, I don't mind scrutinizing questions, but I just want you to know this. I will never bow the knee to a God who'd allow an, who'd allow an orphan to starve in Africa. No way. Well, here was my answer. I said, it sounds like you're incredibly sensitive to suffering, but not to sin, which is the ultimate cause of suffering. If you're asking God to remove suffering without removing sin, you're asking God to square the circle. What would happen to you if God came back tonight and removed every speck of sin and judgment? He was done. He was done. That's like a punch to the solar plexus. He was done fighting right then because he realized that in his demand for justice in ending suffering, he was actually condemning himself as a sinner. And so there are simple answers we can use to show people how inconsistent their worldview is. It can't hold together. It's just fragmented as can be. All right, letter D in your outline. We have to know that the world's philosophies have taken unbelievers captive. Now, this capturing of unbelievers is basically described in Colossians 2.8. I'll be reading from Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to... To Christ, Colossians 2.8. So my question for you folks is this. Do you see any middle ground there? <laughs> do you see any neutralized, do you see any neutral area, any demilitarized territory? No, it's either you're a free man or woman in Christ or you're a captive. That's how ubiquitous the lie is in our world. Colossians 2.8 is a kind of watershed, a kind of continental divide that really divides all people. Our knowledge that has caused us to know God savingly is resident in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the living word incarnate. He's the eternal utterance of God. He is the logos. And all the treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge are resident in the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave him to restore to us the light that was lost in original sin. God gave Christ to us to be our light. For in thy light we see light, Psalm 36, 9. And Christ had to die to give you and me the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is so important for us. We can't reason properly until we receive revelation. And you can't receive revelation so as to reason rationally until you're regenerated. I love all those R's. It's kind of a memory device. Revelation, rationality, reasoning, regeneration, receptivity, they're all connected. If you know Christ tonight, it's because God regenerated you to be receptive to his revelation that you might reason rationally to the glory of God. That is the new mind. That is the mind of Christ right there. Now, one of the problems in sharing a Christian worldview approach is that we set up a tension between truth and error. In our world that measures microaggressions, that can look like a bad deal. Oh, I don't want to set anything up that someone might be offended by. I just want you to know that in 15 years of sharing the gospel with this approach, I think I've seen people offended maybe twice. One of them was a 
doctoral candidate and a woman who had a degree in Russian and international relations from Ohio State. And as I was taking her through the worldview questions, she said, nothing is wrong with the world. Evolution is right on time. And I said, well, can I ask you a question related to morality? Are you capable of moral outrage at victimization? That's a fair question, isn't it? Aren't you outraged when, when someone victimizes someone helpless? And her answer was, conversation over. But 99% of the time, people are willing to keep talking. But she realized that if she supported evolution as the what? The destruction of the unfit, then she would have to celebrate when a victim dies, and she could not do that. Her worldview made no sense. It had no internal coherence, did it? None whatsoever. So when we bring up truth in contrast to error, light in contrast to darkness, you think that people would be offended. I find that they're not. I find that they are willing to talk. And there's a great big reason for that. God has placed the knowledge of himself in a rudimentary fashion in the conscience of every person. And so though, though they've barricaded themselves in a host of false worldviews, you can preach under the wall and over the wall if you aim at the conscience. And so we do that. We do that. Talk about boldness in evangelism. I come into every situation knowing that God has made a revelation of himself evident to them in creation and evident within them in conscience. In general revelation, before they even open a Bible, God has spoken in the creation. And according to Romans 1, 18 through 20, his eternal power, his wisdom, his divine attributes are clearly seen for God made it evident within them, conscience, and evident to them in the creation. There's a little butterfly called a painted lady. Those of you who had biology probably know what it is. A painted lady, any entomologists or biologists in here? Zoology, science majors? Okay. <laughs> they start out as a little tiny lumpy caterpillar. And when they go through metamorphosis to become a full butterfly, it's really a lovely little creature, but very fragile. Out of all the insects in the world, they migrate even farther than a monarch butterfly. They migrate from the edge of the Sahara Desert to Scandinavia and back again. And they ride major air currents. How did that knowledge get put into a little worm? How did that happen? So it knows what flowers to drink at the end of the summer in Sweden. We have no clue. The universe is screaming the knowledge of God. And so when my atheist friends say, sorry, I haven't seen enough data, no, you've seen plenty of data. You're just suppressing it, holding it down in unrighteousness. So when I share the gospel, <clears throat> I know this. Because God put it in them and made it evident to them, a work of correspondence takes place. When we talk about correspondence, it means there's some communication going on. They hear the word of God, and even though they don't read the word of God, they are hearing their creator's voice when they hear this book. A work of correspondence is going on. They know what you're saying is true. Even if they're throwing buckets of dust in the air in protest, they know what you're saying is true. This will change the way you witness. Most of us who witness, witness as if the person we're speaking with has no more reason to believe in Jesus than Buddha. That's false. We know that from Romans 1, 18 through 23. They are actively suppressing what they already know about God. I love what um, apologist John Whitcomb says. In the fall, we lost our ability to love the truth. In the fall, we lost our ability to trust and believe in the truth, but we did not lose our ability to recognize the truth. How would that change your boldness in witnessing if you believe that every unsaved person you talk to has not lost his ability to recognize the truth? Though he hates it and won't believe it, he's not lost his ability to recognize it. So when I go into a witnessing situation, I don't think, wow, this person has no more, believe, no more, no more reason to believe in Jesus than Buddha. Oh, no. <laughs> God's been speaking to him in his conscience and in creation since he was tiny. When Helen Keller became saved, 
a woman who was blind and deaf and mute, and her wonderful nurse figured out a way to communicate her with touching her hand. And the conversation went like this. God has a son, and his name is Jesus. And Helen Keller signed back, I knew this, I just didn't know his name. Do you believe a work of correspondence takes place when you share the gospel? It does. Though the person hides it and will conceal it, it does take place. I was on a Southwest jet and uh, found out I was sitting next to a Mormon missionary. And uh, he said he was just finishing his mission in France. He spoke French, flying to Los Angeles to pass the bar exam. Already had a firm that wanted him as a lawyer. This guy was confident. And so he finally fired his barrage. He says, you Christians, <laughs> everything is through the Bible. He says, we Mormons go directly to God. Direct. You poor people are hampered by the Bible. Now, what do you suppose I said to him? I said, did you know that the fear of God involves trembling at his word? Isaiah 66. You don't fear God unless you tremble at his word. And if you don't tremble at his word, you don't fear him and you don't have an adequate gateway to wisdom and knowledge, Proverbs 1, 7. But there's an even bigger reason why you could be in error, are in error, and that is this. You have no assurance that you're not communicating with a demon when you pray. For the word of God has scribed a very clear boundary of who God is, what he said, and what he requires. And according to scripture, there is a gospel that cannot save you Galatians 1. There's a faith that cannot take you to heaven, James 2. And there's a Jesus that is a different Jesus who disguises his followers as workers of righteousness, though they are workers of evil, 2 Corinthians 11. If you don't use the Bible to contact God, how do you know you don't have a false Jesus, a false gospel, and a false faith? And this guy said to me, no Christian in my life has ever challenged me at that level. So brethren, <laughs> even for him, a work of correspondence was taking place as the scripture found where he was hiding in his false boast, found exactly where he was hiding himself. Roman numeral three, use worldview questions to form a starting point for dialogue and a diagnostic study of erroneous worldviews. And tonight I want to close by sharing with you four worldview questions that I believe are able to diagnose any worldview. I believe these four questions will be able to expose any worldview you can think of. <clears throat> but just before I start, let's remember, though a work of correspondence takes place when people hear the scriptures, they have barricaded themselves inside a castle, a fortress, which locks God out. And sometimes that fortress has a kind of graffiti sprayed on the walls. Sometimes literally. I was at one person's house and their 21-year-old daughter had a big poster in her bedroom. God, please protect me from your followers. Well, that's you and me. <laughs> Obviously, she doesn't want God if she doesn't want followers communicating with her. I was uh, walking at a local a community college a couple months ago and I was using this old Bible and I just was walking through the parking lot and one woman slowed down, shook her fist and said, he's a fraud. He is a fraud. Now can you imagine that? This is part of the stiff arming of God that the natural man does. He wants to keep God at arm's length. Don't make an intrusion. So these worldview questions and you'll find them in letter A here under Roman numeral three. Here are the worldview questions. I've used these for 15 plus years. Where do we come from? Number one, where do we come from? Who made you and me? I was asking some Korean students that the other day. And uh, one of them said, I know, primates. I said, wait, wait, wait. Be careful how you answer that. Because if we came from something that climbed down from a, from a tree, shaved and put on pants, you don't have an argument for dignity. Be careful, you won't be able to answer question number two. Who made you and me? Are we just a biological machine? 
How you answer question one will affect how you answer question two. Question number two, who are we? What is our value? What's the source of dignity? Sometimes I ask, sometimes I ask that question by asking, what is a human being? You'd think if you paid $60,000 to get through USC, you'd be able to answer that question, right? What is a human being? <laughs> well, I ask students this at a number of universities, and I get answers like this. A human being is a four-limbed creature. I said, is someone born with three limbs, three-fourths human? Uh-oh. And then the guy goes, I want to change my definition. A human being is someone who makes contributions to human civilization. I said, what about a quadriplegic who's in a coma? Uh, well, he, he has value because somebody loves him. What about a quadriplegic in a coma who's alienated everybody? I don't know. All they could give me was utilitarian definitions of dignity. None of their definitions were innate dignity because they don't believe we're made in the image of God. There's no source of innate dignity. My wife uh, is an English second language teacher, and I went to a faculty dinner with her. And uh, one of the teachers sitting next to us said, uh, oh, what do you teach, Jay? He said, well, I teach a worldview class. I said, we ask questions like this. Why is your life worth more than a German shepherd? <laughs> and she, this was her response. This was her response. This was teaching our kids. Is it? So my response to her was, can you describe a nation where you have no more rights than a dog? Okay. She wanted to change the subject, order some more tacos. <clears throat> Question number three. What has gone wrong with the world? What has gone wrong with the world? Question number four. What can we do to fix it? And these are really simple questions. A junior higher could ask these questions. But they are profound in revealing a person's worldview. Every time I've asked that question number four of an unbeliever, what can we do to fix it? What can we do to fix it? They've always given me uh, an answer akin to social engineering. We need a mandatory government mandated re education program. Going, that's been tried by Pol Pot and Mao Zedong and Stalin and others. It didn't work, too, didn't work out too well, did it? All right, so after the unbeliever has stumbled all over himself and trying to answer these four questions, you ask them, has anybody ever shared with you the biblical worldview answer to these four questions? No. May I do so? Sure. Do you realize what just happened? Someone just gave you full carte blanche permission to share the gospel. Now, isn't that our challenge when it comes to witnessing? How do you get permission to share the gospel? People are going to feel like you're shoving something down their throat. You're putting your belief on their belief. But I'm telling you, these four questions will get you permission to share the gospel. Every time I've asked it, after 15 years, they've always said yes. They've given me permission to share the gospel. Outside of uh, Cal Arts University, there was a young man with headphones on. He was drumming on an electronic drum. You couldn't hear it. Just an electronic tympanium there. And he took off his headphones, and I go, hey, can I talk to you a minute? Where are you from? You out here to drum with somebody? Yeah, yeah, I'm meeting some guys from the college and so on. I said, well, I got a question for you. Do you think your worldview leans more toward biblical or Eastern mysticism? He goes, definitely Eastern mysticism. I got my own guru. And so I said, uh, well, just out of a, out of, as a courtesy, would you be willing to step onto biblical worldview turf for a minute and I ask you a few questions? Sure. So I asked him the four worldview questions. He gave me permission to give him the gospel answers. And what do you think he did? Man, I'm so glad I met you. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> that was after 10 minutes. That's not because I'm a nice person. It's because people are surprisingly grateful. You'd be amazed now, a lot of us grew up in a Sunday school class. You'd be amazed how few people can give you the plan of salvation. Very few. Well, let's go back through the four real quick, and I'll give you the answers, and it's actually written in your handout. <clears throat> Take a look. Where do we come from? The Almighty Creator made the universe out of nothing. He upholds it. He has a perfect plan and purpose for it, which he's executing with faithfulness, goodness, and wisdom. Wow. 
That's the opposite of chance and impersonal, isn't it? Question number two, who are we? We are created in God's image to know God. He made us in His likeness so we might have fellowship with Him in a love relationship. Our worth, our dignity, our purpose are bound up in being created in His image. And God has an absolute claim upon us and a perfect blueprint for us. Things are looking good so far, but we haven't talked about what's gone wrong with the world. All right, number three, what has gone wrong with the world? Our first parents, sometimes I say Eden, sometimes I don't, our first parents broke faith with God. And sin entered as a destructive principle. It caused idolatry and death and suffering and ignorance and fear and separation from God. Sin is disastrous. It is behind war and oppression and greed. And you could add to that list victimization and holocaust and so on. All right, now the big question. What can we do to fix it? What can we do to fix it? Only God can repair what is broken. God has a perfect plan to restore man to his created purpose of knowing him and loving him and worshiping, obeying, enjoying, and serving him. The only begotten Son of God came to earth 2,000 years ago to explain God to man and to lay down his life in crucifixion as a perfect sacrifice and substitute to bring believing sinners to God. And only by Christ's death is sin put away and forgiven. By Christ's death, men and women are forgiven and restored to their created purpose to enjoy fellowship with God. Now you could say a lot more. But I try to keep my answers within a sentence or two on each one. And they're amazed at the cohesion. They're amazed how these four beats of redemptive history fit together so beautifully, both the problem and the answer. See, for them, everything is normalized. Evil, death, suffering, war, victimization, that's a constant, just a flat line constant. They don't understand that sin and death came in as a cruel intruder. And Christ came to rid that cruel intruder from the human race. And so when you bring this to them, it is truly good news. No matter what their politically correct view, this is radically good news. So my first point of contact with the unbeliever is his or her created identity as the image of God. That's my cosmological first start. Because God owns you, he owns every molecule in your body, he owns every cell in your body, he knows what you need. He knows who you are. He knows your problem. He knows your predicament. And only the Son of God can restore you to Him. And so we need to put truth and error into bold relief, bold contrast. This is not a new approach. Our Savior did it in the Gospel of John, chapters 3 through 12 I ask you to look at those chapters and see how clearly Christ put truth and error into contrast. He set up a tension between truth and error. It was his major way of teaching, was it not? And the Apostle Paul did it when he reasoned daily in the synagogues and marketplaces, and that's described in Acts 17. So this is not a new approach. It's very biblical. God has set up a radical contrast between his wisdom and the false wisdom of the world, and that's described so beautifully in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 22. God is going to put the folly of human wisdom on display. He's going to destroy it in ways that are graphic and exemplary of how wonderful his wisdom is and how foolish it is to take a stand against God. And he's doing it through the wisdom that the world calls foolishness. He's doing it through the cross of Christ. He's putting to death human wisdom He's making an example of it. He's shaming it through the cross of Christ. He's going to hang that false wisdom on the gallows forever as folly. And who's he appointed to tell the world about this? Is it angels or is it believers? It's you and me. We often pray, Lord, is it possible to save America? Father, is it possible? It seems like we're on the edge of a cliff. Well, I want God to produce something wonderful here. But we are his hands and feet when it comes to taking action, are we not? So let me leave you with this challenge tonight. The challenge is this. Reaffirm in your own mind and heart that biblical worldview is a perfect description of reality. It describes our world, its origin, who we are, human experience, who we are, what we need. It describes it all. And the more confidence you have in that, the more bold will be your witness. 
Amen? Amen.